Um, well, good morning. I'm Caroline Kern of Pegahorn Press, and thank you so much for being here. And I'm here with B. Oakley of Gender Fail and Jean Vaccaro, <laughs> uh, curator, scholar, uh, all around magical person. <laughs> um, so today will just be like a fairly casual conversation. Um, you know, just we've already spoken on the phone about just having things be kind of more organic and just talking about our experiences uh, navigating invisible illness and disability within publishing and also like art publishing and also kind of the larger art world in general. Um, so it might cross over not specifically just, you know, for like publishing, but I think all these things kind of our lives spread out in other ways into whether that's gallery, museum world, et cetera. There's all these different intersections or within the university context, uh, just to be clear about that. And um, so we we're just going to kind of uh, talk about that and then leave space for people to share uh, how their feelings about this or experiences uh, towards the end. And so I guess just to start, um, to introduce myself, I'm Caroline Kern of Pegacorn Press, have also been known as Caroline Paquita. I've been doing Pegacorn Press since about 2012, but been making zines since like 1996. Um, been doing Riso Publishing since about 2009. And in 2016, I got a concussion working on a book in another country, and that's kind of my first little uh, foray into uh, disability. And uh, for a long time, I was on treated concussion, and I was doing fairs and like totally out of my mind, like kind of like marbles thrown into a box rolling around. And I'd, you know, because I had had a kind of, you know, some, maybe some doctors who kind of didn't really diagnose things correctly, you know, so. So I was just kind of like would be doing these fairs and having deadlines and really struggling, not really understanding. And so uh, it wasn't until pandemic happened, I was in New York forever um, living there that I finally, during pandemic, started have, being treated for concussion. Things got a lot better. But then I got COVID, as most people in this room have had. And now I've um, been pretty uh, disabled by long COVID in multiple long COVID clinics, heart procedure, meds, cardiologists, all the, the whole thing. So it's kind of been from one invisible illness or disability or complication into another. So it's like from a mental to a full on physical and then all of the things in between. So um, it's something I'm thinking a lot about and how, especially as if you don't have any visible uh, things that people know, you're often people don't really uh, consider that you might have needs. And I actually think most of the needs that people are asking for are mo things that everybody needs, usually. But um, so that's a little introduction of me and where I'm coming from. And I've just wanted to speak because I feel like uh, with, in terms of the pandemic, which is still going on, it's not over, um, there's been a more openness within larger world and community and talking about the struggles that people have been going through because so many people have been impacted on a personal level and with their family members, coworkers, everybody around in a way that like this was ignored kind of prior, kind of like you had to have like a closer connection to it. But like now everybody's kind of seen people get wrecked by this one thing, but it's opened the door to talking about a lot of other things and so on that note, that's where I'm coming from. Um, we can go down the line and, you know, you can introduce yourself and what's going on. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm B. Oakley. Um, I run this project, Gender Fail, which I've been doing since 2015, uh, run it by myself. And kind of my perspective and where I'm coming from, basically since uh, 2010, you know, uh, um, panic disorder and anxiety runs, you know, in my family. My dad has it really bad. Um, and, you know, especially ever since the pandemic, like my agoraphobia has gotten really bad. This is basically the first time I've been <laughs> either away from my car or my home because having a car is like an extension of a home space um, basically since the pandemic. And, you know, one thing I think with this panel that I wanted to speak to is like, I'm, I know there's others like me that through the pandemic and lockdown. It's like, imagine that your lockdown didn't last like the what, what was normal, like five, six months. Imagine it lasting three years. Um, you know, like how phones, iPhones have like the health app. I was just curious. I looked back last month and I like 
walked an average of like 600 steps per day just to kind of get a sense of how little mobility I have. Um, and, you know, basically since 2010, like, you know, I, I have generalized anxiety every day and, you know, thankfully like through time I've like learned to live with it a little better, but, um, you know, it's very easy for me to have a panic attack to kind of do anything. And, you know, especially being like, it was, it's cool to be in this kind of conversation too, because I think to a certain extent we all, or a lot of us experience like anxiety or even have the opportunity to have a panic attack. But when it's basically every day, um, it's a lot, you know, and I am on, I'm on medications for things, but you know, um, it's a lot. And, you know, I feel like I'm a good example of, um, outside of long COVID, which, you know, you can speak to like this kind of like mental health crisis, which I think we've all read about. Um, that's me. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I have a very good outlook on these things and, with my practice of gender fail, like I've really like used this as like a Palma source of inspiration. I um, published this book, I love this title. It's as glamorous as a rotting animal, queerness and mental health. And it really spoke to how, you know, um, depression or panic disorder, anxiety disorder has become an unintentional source of strength and intertwined with my queer identity too. So um, yeah, I mean, I do have a good perspective on it. It sucks, but I just lie down a lot, which is an ideal. And just my physical health has taken a toll too. So outside of just, you know, mental health doesn't, for me, it is so intertwined with physical health and physical symptoms and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think I'll stop there with my ramblings. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Hi, I'm Jean Vaccaro. I want to really thank Caroline and B for sharing this space. And it's nice to be in here with the quiet. <laughs> um, it's an immediate kind of relief to the intensity of being here, which is also probably some of what we'll um, talk about today. So I'm coming at um, this work really from the perspective of being a writer and a curator and a teacher um, and thinking about how often I can kind of be a barrier between an institution, whether that's a museum or a gallery or a university, and the people that are on the other side of that, the artists or the students, and kind of creating these spaces of access and care. Um, and it's much easier for me to do that than for myself, um, also coming from a background of having um, chronic Lyme and kind of just dealing with sort of invisible illness, but also the you know, just fighting up against, you know, medical gatekeeping and the difficulty of having your experience be validated and named by others. And I randomly sprained my ankle. And even just the act of having Caroline come and get me in a wheelchair, it's like I'm so aware of how, like, asking for help and care is so difficult. And um, so just this, so thank you so much. And also just the space of having that um, sort of honored that we all do need help and assistance and care is really um, incredible. And so I'm grateful to... Uh, the book fair to have this conversation and a sort of a bookmark and a placeholder for people to think about the importance of naming care in all of its various forms and thinking about disability um, from mental health to physical health to the things that we can and can't see. And I think moving out of the um, kind of the acuteness of the pandemic into what is just like a chronic pandemic and climate crisis and um, all of these, you know, really devastating and I, for me personally, hard to navigate emotionally kind of questions, um, what it means for all of us to have the care that we need. And um, I think coming into a, the sort of coming up against the cognitive dissonance of a lot of people who don't sort of honor and um, acknowledge where we are all kind of needing assistance. And so I, I can kind of like talk more about different things along the way, but maybe that, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah. I just also wanted to make it clear just also to the room and for future people listening to a recording that like this is by no means like a comprehensive discussion on the full spectrum of disability. Um, I had some feedback online because I've been posting asking for people to send in their experiences and somebody was like, are you going to be representing like severely impacted and ho homebound people? And I, I just want to recognize that that is like a very valid critique to ask me. Um, there was a lot of variables that I was not able, like just actually having major health crises re real recently and trying to form this and be here. I was kind of like, oh my God, I like I need to represent everybody. How can I do this? Um, it's, this is just one micro of a macro conversation. Um, and just to be clear that um, none of us are the authority on any of this and just, these are our, our personal experiences. 
and to acknowledge, you know, that 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 is good feedback from people. And I, I'm just glad to know that it's being recorded so that it's accessible. Because that was another question where I was like, I can't even think of the AV. Like, I can, getting this printed this morning, I was like, okay, I got the thing printed, you know. Like, now get, walk to the train and get to the thing. You know, it's like sometimes, you know, in the world of pacing and planning, the, you know, I was asked, like, oh, do you need the computer? I was like, absolutely not. It's enough to hold a microphone and engage and speak, let alone get into computers and Zoom and all sorts of other technological things that would, honestly, between my concussion and just energy from long COVID, I can't, there's only so much I can do. Um, but so, and I also know all of us are pretty ragged from, I know B and I from doing tabling, which I love being in the fairs and connecting with people. That really fuels a large part of my practice and how I meet other artists, other publishers, making connections, um, whether that's just in all the ways, international friends, all the things, I love it. It takes so much energy to be here and be present and also represent my practice and the artists that I work with that I really, you know, to be here, it means a lot to me to engage that it's almost like I have to shut down my needs because it's an opportunity. Because a lot of time I'm by myself, taking care of myself, and I'm not able to do this continual engagement. So it's like I save up all the batteries mm -hmm. to do four days, and then it's going to be, you know, a lot of repair work in the aftermath. Um, so, I mean, in speaking of that, like, we can just talk about how it is navigating fares. And also deadlines and projects and the way, like, the ways that people have set up constructive means in working, knowing that you have maybe some limitations or, I mean, like I said, I think most of the accommodations are things that most people need um, that aren't recognized. But, yeah, what are some of the things that you all have done to, like, advocate for yourself or, yeah, just op opening things up, too, for however you all want to interject. Um, maybe I'll just jump in just kind of talking about navigating the fair is like like Caroline is saying like having conversations with people is so generative so incredible so amazing but yeah I'm I'm <laughs> the day just started and I'm already so exhausted and like you know even this morning it's like can I do this even it's like that moment of like can I get out of bed and actually like take on this day but one small thing that I've done it seems really simple and almost not worth mentioning, but it is, of course, you know, that's my mind saying, is this where, but I, you know, I put a lot of time into like having this great price list and menu with a lot of good information. So it's like, you know, saves on the conversation, like how much is this? What is this? It's like simple, like a piece of paper can actually do so much labor <laughs> that, you know, having those conversations, like I never want to be rude and just like point at it. Like I would never do that. Just be like, you know, like that would be so rude and condescending, yeah. but, but to be like, you know, all this information's here and I have even now, like way for people to self check out. Um, I don't know if that will happen, but you know, that'd be amazing if it could, but, and just one other thing just to mention for my everyday life, I do live in, um, Queens in New York city, which is a very like intense and active place, which I think sometimes just being in that city, like it's generative, but it's like exhausting to like even get out sometimes. But thankfully like my studio is like right in my living space. And that is something if I didn't have that, if I had to travel to another space to do my work i don't think i'd be able to do it um and i think it's important for at least for me and my disorder to be able to do everything at home because i spend so much time at home um it's not great i end up working every day or my life is just work or gender fail and rest but um, i'm willing to make that sacrifice to continue to make work and also i want to say it's like all of us coming from this perspective have energy issues. It's like, we can still make incredible work and we do. And I love that, you know, it's like, we, you don't have to be, you know, fully able to be able to make amazing work. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, I love that. And it's a good reminder of that too, that even though I'm not at my hundred percent energy or ability wise, like we make such good work. I mean, you're a powerhouse. You're always putting things you're, out. I mean, we're all Yeah. Powerhouse. Yeah. But I'm always kind of like, yeah. wow. Okay. You know, like, it's like a full on another project. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess the thing that I've been really thinking about is what it means to sort of like tell on oneself, and like meaning asking for help and asking for things to be set up so that you can sort of navigate the world with a little bit 
more ease, you know, whether it's like making a price list to kind of reduce some of the labor costs or just naming out loud, it's going to be really difficult for me when I get back from this thing. For me, I don't, you know, I'm not working at this fair, but as a participant, the kind of like mental acrobatics of being like, oh, it's going to be really too hard for me and I'm going to have FOMO. And then I have this new trick someone taught me, which is JOMO, joy of missing out. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm going to miss out, but I'm going to, you know, but it's still, it's, it feels really, you know, it's ice, it's, we're coming, you know, it's been a time of really intense isolation. And so it feels really sad to miss out on things. And I think one way um, that I kind of try to think about modeling is, you know, for me personally, I, I prefer to wear a mask. So even like in a classroom, I do that. And even though my students kind of mostly don't, some do, and I feel like there's just that kind of point of connection where people feel like a sense of, you know, comfort and even just asking people, you know, it's going to be really hard for me. I'm going to need X, Y, or Z thing. And then allowing people to show up, it's very difficult, but I think just sort of like tattling in yourself and naming what you need because it kind of helps to destigmatize, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the fact that we are all in kind of a place where like we need help in community and that kind of collective care um, established, you know, mm -hmm. it's really, I think for me, it's just really challenging because it feels like I'm a burden on others. And I know that I would, ne I never feel that way towards anyone else. I would never feel it, but it's just, I think a really like difficult thing to overcome, you mm -hmm. know, and unpack. Yeah. It's so interesting that throughout the years, like with people that I know, like even this morning, like I'm getting texts from people in New York where they're like, hey, remember, it's a, you know, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, you know, and just, like, knowing that, and, you know, they're my friends that are, have been very caring and supportive of just being, like, okay, remember to take breaks and, like, take care of yourself. Is somebody going to, like, maybe watch the table while you're on the panel, you know, or different things like that. And um, just throughout the years of being able to communicate to other people that are listening that then, because some, you know, we're all our worst advocates sometimes where we don't take care of ourselves and we're like, go, go, go. And you need that person to say like, Hey, take, take a break, please. You know, like it's okay. If you need to step away from the table, just go. Like, it's fine. I mean, at this point I kind of, if I need to go, I just go. I used to feel really like I shouldn't. And, um, but sometimes like, especially the New York fair when it was at, at PS1 in the tent, I mean, I would always be on the on the wall of the tent. And I'd just crack it open and just step outside there, and I'd be like, okay, you know, just get some air, like get, drink some water. Um, I know for myself, I had like, I have like a shelf that I have uh, with titles, and underneath is like basically a little apartment that has like <laughs> snacks and all these other things, like uh, essential oils, a smell, you know, like it's basically people are like, whoa, what's back here, you know, like besides supplies for the table and for as I'm selling things, but like all the things for care, whether that's your medications, water, like I almost forgot to take my medication that I have to take every four hours. Like I was like, oh, I should probably take that so I don't bottom out during the talk, you know. Um, but just like all these little things that I will be around other exhibitors who haven't ate breakfast and they've had four coffees and they're going on fire and I'm like, I cannot do that or going partying every night. I'm pretty like at last night it actually did go out and I was like, Whoa, <laughs> Whoa, I did two things. I went to an opening and then we went to a party on the river. But, and my friends who are also ill were like, I can't believe you did that. And I was like, I sat like the whole time and someone drove me. If I actually had to take myself around, I would have been like, no, no, no train back to the house, but being driven around, whole different night yeah but just like you know during the fair these types of things and I think besides just the fair the act of leading up to the fair with publishing and, and in general just writing and everything thinking about deadlines um, working with other people like I know for myself I try to pad things out thinking there's going to be a fallout at some point never putting it like I'll say the deadline for the fair any book is like three weeks before the fair because you know everybody's going to be late with something or something breaks or some kind of complication but what do you all do like how much lead time what are do you speak with other people that you're working with and let them know that's something I've been doing more so before I was always kind of worried about like we spoke on the phone looking unreliable sometimes I think there's this connection if you say I have illness, I have these other things that people start to feel like you're unreliable. 
So how do you preface projects and how you're working with people? Yeah, that's such a, you know, I think I was speaking to like agoraphobia. Like one thing that I did is I just stopped making plans with people and I don't really have like a robust friend group. I thankfully had like a, an amazing partner, but um, yeah, that is not something I do because I would be flaky. Like, you know, like part of also like feeling like this is like I try to like take a little bit of accountability. It's like, you know, the illness or like my mental health things cause me to stop doing things, but I still like want to take accountability to that. And that's why I don't get myself in situations like that. But I also wanted to, um, oh, also when I work with artists, I try not to do any deadlines. Like even if it's not done for the, for fairs and stuff like that, I don't work with deadlines, which gets me in trouble. Like sometimes, a lot of times what happens is like, I just got in this period where four books were basically done at the same time and it's bad, but um, <laughs> you know, I do that. And I want to speak to one other point about you know, kind of doing fairs, like fairs are cool, like we love fairs, but like I wrote this publication, like a publisher's perspective on the art book fair and tried to like kind of talk about how spaces could improve, especially from like kind of this perspective, like again, I'm not a monolith and I don't speak for everyone, but it's like, you know, art book fairs are cool, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and, and bigger isn't always better. Like having 400 exhibitors, I don't think, it's cool. I mean, it's great having so many people here, but you know, I just, yeah, bigger isn't better. I think that's the thing that I've kind of realized, like, um, growth comes at a cost, you know. Just think about even, like, climate and stuff like that. Growth is, um, we give a lot for that. And I, I try to think more in terms of sustainability, which it seems like, you know, is something that I'm trying to do more, like, sustain gender fail, which is my main source of income. You know, I don't want to grow it. I want to sustain it. You know, that's that's where I'm at, you know. I'm, I'm especially being in academia, that's a whole night. I don't have to deal with bosses a lot, which is pretty <laughs> mm -hmm. rad, and that's makes my life a lot better. Um, yeah, I mean, I think ways. you're totally pointing to this idea that we have to just keep, like, pushing ourselves in order to have this, like, sense of success, and it's really, like, damaging, and it's just, like, bad when you know you're going to just take the hit on yourself, you know? Um, I just have, like, a funny story, which is I was contributing to a book that's coming out soon that everyone should get. It's called 99 Objects in Trans History that Chris Vargas edited for um, MAFA. That's his project called the Museum of Transgender History and Art, and it's, like, 99 objects. And they asked me to write three entries, and the entries were, like, one page, like, 500 words. And I was writing three of them, and Chris is a friend of mine, so we were, you know, I was being pretty, like, bad with my deadlines, as I am with all the time. And at some point, I was, like, Chris, was I the worst of all the contributors? And without even half of a second passing, I was like, was I the slowest? And he was like, yes. <laughs> like it uh -huh, took me yeah. one year to write these three <laughs> pages. Sometimes I think you can like take the slack with a friend who will understand. But I think um, when I work with artists or when I work with writers as an editor, it's really, um, I mean, I feel a lot of like empathy. I, I, deadlines are, they're just these imposed like obligations that are, often to serve other people and they often just don't also serve the work, you know, mm. like besides serving our mental and physical health and well-being, I think they often don't serve the work to have things kind of operating in this like compression. And like I said at the outset, I feel like I often have to pass along the kind of deadlines or the urgency from the institution. And what I really want to do is be like a shield and not take it on myself and not pass it on so that other people have to feel this like need for things to be so quick because you know, just like our, our thinking processes are really hindered, I think, by these kinds of, um, these deadlines. And I've been working with an artist for a project at the ICA. And one of, when we had our first studio visit, there was a lot of back and forth and canceling and this and that. And I was like, I love when people cancel because then I can cancel. <laughs> and I like, I'm like the least like aggrieved by a canceler. I'm like, please cancel on me so I can cancel on you. Um, and, you know, our whole studio visit wasn't even really about their art practice so much as just, like, the frustration with not being able to be slow enough in order to think and work. And so I think, like, as much as we can, like, as friends, as curators, as editors, as publishers, like, find ways to support people to take the time they need to inhabit their practice so it doesn't feel like it's on this clock of urgency, you know? Yeah, I mean, that actually, I had, you know, on Instagram asked a lot of people, I just kept on putting out and asking people to repost uh, for people to share their experiences, which this is a good time to share this one thing that um, Jack Grove sent to me. Uh, they're an artist in New York, and they said it was thoughts on turnaround time. And they wrote, I've started initiating conversations with collaborators and curators early in our relationship about deadline management. As a chronically ill artist, I have unexpected bad days that interfere with my ability to be productive. 
Usually to circumvent, uh, circumnavigate this, I build in buffer days and plan to finish early. Two, I ask for the understanding that I'll need at least, uh, at the very least, 48 hour turnaround for all action items. Yet, inevitably, unexpected sudden deadlines come up, and this gets tricky. For example, some days I can easily update my artist statement and bio and send it back within a tight six hour end of day deadline, but on a bad day, this ask would be very difficult and likely send me into a frustrated, stressed shame spiral where both my writing and my health suffer. To avoid this, early communication, clear deadline lists, and empathy are necessary. Um, and I definitely resonate with that as well. Like, even setting up this panel um, with David Sr., who is lovely and very communicative and very understanding, that week I was, uh, my health was tanking and I was in a pain clinic and everything and I was like well on the topic of the panel actually sorry for my delay I was dealing with like you know, diagnosis and meds you know um he was very understanding just naming it too like this is where I'm having delays like this is my complications because it does start to seem as we all know probably of organizing other things you start to be like why is this person not writing back you know but just getting that and understanding of why they might not be running, writing back, whether that's family, emergency, them, whatever, just that context. And it's not a, using it as an excuse, but just giving some context that it's also this kind of, I think, you know, as we talked in the call, like during the deeper parts of the pandemic, there was this thing that started happening where everybody was just talking about, oh, like grace with time and space and understanding and like this is a time for things to change and we don't have to live in the grind. Well, that's over. Like, and we were talking about like, what are the lessons that were learned during that time? And, and it kind of all got back rolled, you know, in this way, like as soon as you could, they're like economy back on everybody back to work, no more work at home, you know, all the things. And, but there was like this point that really could have like shifted the ways that we thought about work and expectation and care and not just because you're ill, but just because it's good for everybody. And I think some of that grind is what makes people ill and it fuels all people's conditions to, you know, and also like the shame spiral of like you're not meeting these deadlines that are, I mean, you know, you could be in the middle of something else and somebody is like, you need to have this done in two hours. And you're like, I'm at work. Like there's not a computer here. I don't, you can't do this. Like, what are you talking about? So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just have, like, during the pandemic, I was in, I got a teaching job somehow, like, because they needed, like, I was teaching at School of the Museum of Fine Arts and got hired during the height of the pandemic, like, in, you know, November of 2020, where it's still, like, everything was remote. And then I ended up teaching there for four semesters, but they abruptly were, like, only in person, no exceptions. And, like, I put so much work and care into making the online experience as good as any in person. And, um, you know, and I was... I kind of like thankfully had gender fail as a source of income. So I was not, I was rude to the administration. Like I didn't give them the respect because they weren't giving me the respect back. It's kind of freeing. I was kind of like, I'm actually going to speak my mind. And I also had students that experienced like, you know, blatant transphobia and racism from them. And I'm like, I'm going to name this. I'm going to say it. I don't care if I burn a bridge, which I'm sure I did. But um, yeah, the, the, no, the fact that like, this rigid, no online classes, it's like, let's actually think about the class and the experience and what it will do for the students more than like how it will look for the university. Cause I think universities want to be in person because you know, in person equals quality education, but um, that might not always be the case for all things. So that was just one backslide. I quit, you know, probably burned a bridge and was like unprofessional, but I love to be able to speak my mind. You know, not everyone's in that situation though. Like some people need jobs and can't just, be honest, which honest is rude, right? In our society, I always forget that. Like honest usually is rude. Um, but yeah, it was just like, that was like one huge backslide. And it's like, you know, universities are getting so expensive and yeah. And someone's still teaching my class, I guess, even though they're not supposed to. And they're like, I've got had like students be like, oh, I took the class that you started. I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, it's cool, but it's like still like all that labor I put in is now, you know, the university is still using and employing, but. Um, bye bye, Dendrophil. Yeah. 
I'll just say two quick things. One, like, something amazing about the pandemic is how it was so possible for people to, like, activate these accessible technologies that seemed impossible before. Like, you could never come into the conference virtually. Like, you have to spend all this money and time and energy. Like, all of a sudden, all of this stuff was completely at our fingertips all along, <laughs> you know? And so I think um, it's... You know, I wanted to just like actually name an event that I went to recently that was an example of something that felt like a really successful um, iteration of providing sort of collective care, which was um, an event at Performance Space in New York that was called I Want to Be With You Everywhere that was organized by a collective of artists, um, including Carolyn Lazard and Amal Dublon and uh, Tina Zavastinos, a bunch of folks. And it was all focused on like uh, two days of kind of organizing performances, workshops on disability and mutual aid and there was a whole kind of hybrid experience that was happening where people were like were brought in for an open mic and people you know it was alternating between like in person and on stage and on the screen and there was food and water and there were like quiet spaces and like sen areas for like sensory like rest and you know at, like the institution had to work really hard to create all of these like opportunities and they had to do so much on the back end but it was totally possible and it made the experience I think feel amazing to be there like when you go somewhere and you actually feel rejuvenated rather than kind of drained so I guess thinking about ways that we can like lean into these technologies to create more access and insist that institutions like do better because it's completely within their reach and mm -hmm. realm you know yeah another thing someone wrote to me just thinking about like making spaces accessible was this person uh, from Japan that connected with me through a artist book I did about my concussion which was just all video stills because I was very like Whoa, like just the way I navigated that was just started making these like hyper frenetic like videos that I posted on Instagram and Knust from the Netherlands uh, published it when I did a residency with them and this person in Japan got it when they were there for the Tokyo Art Book Fair and so we've become friends uh, online and they wrote to me Sometimes the art book fair itself is challenging for people with limited energies due to chronic illness and invisible disability. Joining as an exhibitor is nice, but it is way more exhausting because the large fairs require many hours and days at the table, and sometimes the space is overcrowded. Due to my chronic illness with my thyroid and bipolar neurodiver neurodivergence, I simply want more accessible fairs and events. Which the overload, I mean, I know for myself... I'm in a pretty good space right now um, due to lots of medications and therapies, but uh, there's been times at fairs where I'm wearing like loop earplugs the whole time. I have my concussion glasses before I had the, all this neuro eye stuff done. And I can't imagine, that's just even from where I'm coming from, like just, yeah, an agoraphobia and space and people and the sound and the activation and then if somebody starts flashing a light I'm like please please don't do that you know and just thinking about all the considerations of yeah making spaces more accessible for I mean it's kind of like you're saying like bigger isn't always better you know if this is a celebration of bringing a lot of different people in from all around the world and the population is make it worth the exhibitors while to be here um, I totally understand that as being on a a co-director of the Pittsburgh Art Book Fair, we're bringing in people and you're like, we need to make this as best as possible. Like why ask people to come to our city and table for days if it's not gonna be big and great? But also thinking about like, are people gonna be burned out? I think the Printed Matter team's done a great job throughout the years of like creating spaces where there's snacks and spaces and things or and being yeah, able to breast yeah, yeah, gotten better. It, yeah. It, yes, like Sunel has definitely been like, make this better. Breastfeeding area, you know, these different spaces. Mm -hmm. Luckily here you can just step right outside and you're outside, which is nice. <laughs> Some In New York it was always a little bit harder to get outside, to be honest. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, just thinking about like the time going into making spaces more accessible um, and comfortable, which is hard, especially... When you're in New York, which just being outside anywhere in New York, you're like, ah, you know, like it's activating. Um, so yeah, those are things I'm always thinking about of like, we you can't control those things. So then you have tools in your little toolbox, which what kind of tools do you have in your toolbox for navigating these things? 
I mean, like even I did the fair four years ago, and one day I think it was on Saturday, I just left, and and that was a tool. Like it's kind of like fight or flight, but it's like <laughs> I just left the space, you know, and um, like for the day, just gone. I think I came back. Uh huh. I I, I, I think I remember now. this. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a I, but also again, um, I was talking about consequences, like. My table neighbors, I should have covered the table. They had to deal with some stuff for me, and I put them in a bad situation. So it's like I did what I needed to do to get out of there, but there are repercussions to these things because of, like, systems not being there. So it's like, you know, and I take accountability. Like, even Caroline and I shared a studio, and, like, I, you know, did some things that were careless, probably not thinking or going fast that we, you know, worked through. I mean, it was like, yeah, it's just like, you know, take accountability and not blame illness but understand illness or like wanting the world to okay. more i think it's just important but um what else do i do i um i mean it's almost like i take xanax and i take like the smallest amount because i never want to be it's an addictive substance like i think i take 0.1 milligrams it's so little but it's enough that it can get me out of the house you know mm -hmm. like um because that stuff is addictive and you know there's so many instances of like you know folks on pain medication that get addictive and thankfully I've been taking it on and off for years and I go off of it a lot but anyway like I, I to do this event I need it you know if I didn't have some Xanax there's no way and, mm -hmm. and hell. Um, so medication is important you know I'm also on proxetine I don't even know what it is really like mm -hmm. that's the thing with like treating mental health like I've been on so many medications like they can't say for certain that what it does you know other people have taken it. It's just like with brain and stuff. It's yeah. It's weird, but um, yeah. I, there's probably other you, you, you. I guess um, I finally bought a water bottle like two oh, yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> um, the level of dehydration <laughs> I have endured over the years. Um, yeah, I, I try to bring water and food. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like really the most. And then like, like I said, like tell people and telling myself and just have you know ask somebody to meet me somewhere, help me get around, just like make a plan for afterwards, have like a plan with it. Like after this, I'll meet a friend and have like a meal in a low key way without a bunch of people around and just like decompress. But, um, yeah. And keep all my little medicines and I have all the stuff. I mean, I guess I'm curious too. I don't know what our, I'm not sure what our time is, but you know, just to hear from folks in the audience too, like what their kind of strategies and like ideals are for spaces. Cause I think yeah. Kind of collectively imagining what's possible is a really important part of this work too. Just, you know, asking like what it is that people want and need and what they want to see in the world, you know? Yeah. So I mean, I think this is a small enough group that we can just talk, yeah. you know, too. Yeah. Um, there's 20 minutes left roughly. So it's like if people want to interject, I can also give you a microphone. So it's, you know, if anybody feels like sharing, anybody? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's Corey. Thank you for this conversation. This is like very validating and I'm happy that there's space to talk about these topics. I feel like all I want as a chronically ill person is like a safe place to take a nap during the day, oh like to not have to go all the way back to like my apartment. I feel like so often I just get to events early and then like sleep in my car and like maybe that's safe maybe that's not it's also not that comfortable so I really just want I really just want a nap space <laughs> I, I keep like a pillow and blanket in my car when I'm home at all times so that I resonate with that a lot I mean I just you know like I'm saying with agoraphobia and that literally that's my life you know like even now it's like will I make it through the day maybe not and yeah no that's yeah that's yeah, that maybe, but it's like thinking about public. I think there's places, yeah, like, could there be like a, a cot room or something? I don't know. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah, I mean, I know at different museums I've worked at, there's like these secret spaces that people go and take naps at. You know, mm -hmm. you'd be like, oh, yeah, there's. And I, I, some of them, I still haven't found them, but I know that my coworkers have dipped into there and they're gone for a while. But, um, yeah. Well, it just even it makes me think of Shannon Finnegan, who's an artist that some of you may know, um, who makes these benches that say things like, you know, if you're tired, sit here. Like, you know, if, if this walking is too much, sit if you agree. 
Um, <laughs> and just like not even having seating, you know, like just thinking about the museum in terms of access and seating, totally. whether there's an art fair happening or not. Um, there's so little places just to kind of like rest and, um, their Shannon's work is really great and they have an exhibition they curated up right now. I think it's in Cleveland where it's like a conveyor belt, like a giant lazy Susan. And, um, I just thought about the implications of lazy Susan being fucked up. Um, it's a giant <laughs> conveyor belt and the art comes to you. You like sit down and all these chairs and then the art arrives at you, which is a really special way to kind of like foreground people getting to like rest and still, cause you know, to kind of manage the fact of feeling like you, you're left out. You don't get to participate. Right. You know? Is that the show that Lucas is in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have to, I can look up what it's called. for. Yeah. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to read before I forget, um, just because I thought it was important and covers a lot of topics. This was from Faith Levine, who is a curator that we all know, a lovely person. She's now the archivist at Women's Studio Workshop. Um, but she, uh, who's actually struggling with uh, limes right now, um, she wrote, uh, the thing with the spectrum of invisible illness or chronic pain is how complex of a space it can be for the person experiencing it. Remembering that all of us have different levels of capacity to manage, mitigate, and navigate our own realities is a daily reminder. I've been able to reflect that my own pain tolerance combined with unrealistic expectations was a perfect cocktail for years to gaslight myself into minimizing my own disease. Now that I am more self-aware, it's a daily reminder that passing up on events, projects, and saying no to parties is just part of acknowledging my own capacity it's fine and it's not all at once. It also almost only happens internally. All this leads me to one conclusion, never assume anything about anyone ever. We just don't know the circumstances around how someone is experiencing something and it may shift throughout the day. For me, I always wanna be invited even if I say no 99% of the time, same here. Someone else may feel like you may not have gotten the hint, so just generally trying to pay attention and not assume someone wants to talk about their symptoms or how they feel is also important. I appreciate people asking how I'm doing and not assuming that my two major surgeries, quote, fixed me and that I'm, quote, better. The nonlinear part of healing is different for everyone, and, like, and it is like everything... And it is like everything is super complex. Self-awareness, gentleness, compassion, humility. These are all things we collectively need to embrace. And yeah, I, I think it just kind of covers all of this, this together. It's just having grace and generosity with everyone, not assuming. Sometimes, I mean, people have said, oh, you're so sullen. And I'm like, I'm like not even here, you know, like I am like pieced out. Like I have to recharge. I just shut down. Maybe my face looks like I'm sullen or something. I'm not, I don't have any bad feelings about anybody. I'm just in a recharge mode. You know, there's a lot of assumptions I think about where people are at and what's going on and capacity and speaking frankly. I know I've always spoken frankly, but it's definitely gotten more. So in terms of like energy management and that does not work well for people, it seems, it turns out. When really it's just kind of like I can't process forever. Like I'm like brass tacks, yes, no. Project, yes, no. Deadline, yes. Then if someone's like maybe, I don't know. I'm like I, I actually don't have the energy for that. And um, yeah, I think just as, not assuming, not assuming anything is always the key thing. But I also want to leave space for people if anybody else wants to share anything. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to say as a, as a participant in books and editing and making art, um, one thing that's really struck me in the pandemic period is I feel that people are becoming softer around the edges and, and much more understanding to work with one-on-one -on -one, and that's been a really great aspect of um, I think it's also a bit of a generational thing I feel a lot of the times like uh, as a um, Gen Xer like you you know there's people we this is talked a lot about in the media but it's like it's actually kind of really helped me levels of understanding and acceptance um, I think one thing that's been really jarring about the change of pace with the pandemic has been um, 
you know, I also work as like a freelancer. And so you have these sort of dead, the pace of how things have picked up as things just kicked in again has been so hard. So maintaining um, good relationships that are sustainable, you know, it's great to be more understanding, but it's also like, uh, I feel like things feel like they're going too fast for a lot of us while um, another thing is like the profound losses that mm -hmm. we've had and yet things seem to have picked up so harshly. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I feel like institutionally there's such a gap between the interpersonal and working with people who are um, really learning to be softer about issues of perfectionism and all these things yeah. that come up, yeah. you know, um, and then at the same time, the pace of demand is, is really what wears me out and causes a lot, so much anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, like, you know, the American kind of like pull yourself up by the bootstrap, per perfectionism, you know, like you just go, 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 go. And that has not worked for anyone. You know, this is the great American myth, you know, that that's how it goes. And yeah, I agree. Like there, there is a generational thing because I notice, you know, you'll have like uh, parents that are like, or you're, you know, you're, maybe your dad or someone's like, I've never taken a break, you know, and they don't understand. And people are kind of like, what do you mean? Like, just like, come on, just go. Like, you're being lazy. You go and you're like, whereas younger people are like, take all the time you need, you know, <laughs> this is like this thing, you know, and I've noticed even the shift in ways, like other coworkers between, and, and working in projects with older friends that are older versus friends that are younger and about kind of, yeah, the language that's being used in terms of timeline and expectations and, and yeah, there's just more, just having more grace and generosity, I think is key. I just keep on coming back to that with all of it and space for, there was so much potential within deep pandemic. I really thought, you know, with so many different aspects that were going on, whether that was like with the protests and with everything, just everything could have expanded out in all these other ways. And then it just retracted back into the same thing with a lot of cognitive dissonance about that nothing even happened, you know, too, because people are like, oh, it's over, it's done, nothing happened. And you're like, yeah, and then like maybe 20% of the population has long COVID now, okay. And, you know, and this has activated all sorts of other illnesses, you know, reactivated illnesses, made other illnesses worse, um, you know. We have a nurse practitioner in the room, that, you know, that knows a lot about this. Uh, so it's just, it's an interesting time to be alive in navigating this. And, and I also, in part of doing this panel, is just trying to open the conversation up more within this particular community. Um, and it not being, because I think in general, when you say disability, people become really like, like more able-bodied people are like, oh, I can't talk about that. You know, it's this thing. They have an idea. You need, you know, uh, visual aids towards disability, et cetera. And, you know, just it becoming less of a, like a taboo thing. You know, I've even struggled calling myself disabled. I had a friend who's a nurse who's like, you are disabled. Medically, he's like, you are disabled. And we had to really talk about it. And that's a hard thing to accept if you've been able-bodied prior, you know, and um, and maybe like kind of a type A person where you're like, go, go, go. And, you know, and people are like, you used to like never sleep and work all night. And I'm like, I can't do that now, you know. But yeah, just trying to take some of that weight away from it. And it it's to normalize it, not just for myself, but the community and you know, just speak more freely about it, basically. And I think also what you were saying about, like, noticing a, 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 a less rigid edge. Like, I think it is important, like, although it seems like everything has backslided to know that, you know, there has been at least, like, you know, in our perception of the world, a change that mm -hmm. can never fully go back to what it was before. And to, like, see that as an opening, even though, like, other, like, fast changes that, Honestly, a lot were made. I think about why these changes were made. A lot of it was to keep the economy mm -hmm. alive rather than to keep us alive, you know? Um, and just to understand that we all have that, like, same perception of hopefully, like, 
more of a willingness for world changing things um, through that experience and to like, I was going to say capitalize. I hate capitalism. Like all, these, <laughs> yeah. all these words, but to really like communalize, that's not a word, um, but to like come together as a community to make the changes that we need, at least on a small scale. Because mm-hmm. because I think like, especially the news and other like um, divisive forces make it seem like change is impossible, but it's like on small ch- ch- uh, scales and in your own community, change is so possible, happens all the time. It's so malleable. So yeah, that was a good thing to remind me that to stop thinking always in absolutes, like, mm-hmm. you know, that things are a little bit more, um, expansive, fluid, expansive yeah. and intra- contractive and yeah. Um, uh, uh, what, what flubber or what was that from the, um, the green goo? Oh, that's a, yeah. G- Gak or I was thinking, what's the, what's the movie with Robert Williams? Remember flubber? Yeah. Flubber, uh, I don't know. I was like, that wasted so much time trying to think of yeah. that, but I don't know. <laughs> Be more like flubber. That's my last word, I think. Did you want to say anything? What I kind of feel like, I mean, does anybody else want to share any feelings, thoughts? Possibly? I mean. Yeah. I like um, I was just going to say things like this are also like incredibly important for folks who are not in like direct participants, members of disability community, because everybody's able, you know, like everybody has who thinks that they are not vulnerable to disability is living in a denial. Um, we age, we have things happen unexpectedly. And so I just think it's also important to like one, like, extend a lot of, like, care and gratitude to people who are being, like, public and advocates for disability community um, and, um, like, inclusion practices and visioning, because the visioning is super important, but it's also, like, saying, like, utilizing these terms, like, saying, like, you didn't want to use that term Mm -hmm. because at what point in time is it appropriate or, like, how we compare ourselves to others in our ability or, like, our, our, like, suffering Olympics or however we want to like phrase it um, is like a real thing that I think keeps people from using that. But I think also with people who are able-bodied and like don't have like disabling like uh, mental health stuff going on, like it's important to also like advocate and like talk amongst each other to create those spaces. And I think like that's one thing that I find really important about this conversation too is like it's the onus does not need to be just on people who are already like resource deprived and like challenged like and I I just kind of urge that continuation and collaboration so thanks for doing this yeah and I also just want to say that like yeah I'm just thinking about potential future events in these spaces that can happen because of this opening you know Mm -hmm. and um yeah I'm so thankful for that and hopefully someone hearing our panel online or something like that would be like, oh, I can host something like this or continue this conversation for experience outside of like what this was. It's like, you know, you hopefully through this open or we all, I guess, (laughs) open this, you know, as a topic that can be in super intense spaces like this, you know, that require Mm -hmm. a lot of energy. So, um, because, yeah. I mean, I know for myself of just being more transparent about what's going on, not only has that been a resource for people navigating not only post-concussive syndrome, but also with like long COVID, which there's so, no one knows anything. So it's like kind of like resource sharing from there Um, and using, you know, Instagram and uh, mainly, uh, I'm not on Facebook, but just posting about things, trying to be transparent trying to treat, create a culture where it's okay to share these things, not in a, I hate to say overshare because, you know, I don't know, I feel a little, I'm 43, so sometimes I have this tentative relationship with the internet about sharing, et cetera. I've also felt like unsafe in some ways sharing about things because I think about employment and how that affects me. And um, luckily, like, uh, I work at, uh, freelance at Leslie Lohman Museum. They all know that I have long COVID. They all are fine with it. I freelance at MoMA, at PS1. I spoke with my boss. He knows I have long COVID. I had to cancel work about it. But for a long time, I felt very scared talking about it. For unreliability, you get tagged as a person who's ill 
or struggling and then so all of a sudden people are I mean I know some galleries I've worked at at if I say what I'm dealing with I won't get hired um, and so you know just trying to actually be okay about talking about things um, and creating conversations and transparency not only to connect with other people but just kind of put a face on these things because I think unless you're actually dealing with some of it people are like I don't I don't really know and then, you know, they can say, oh, well, yeah, you've spoken very openly online about yeah. what's been going on with you. And I feel like that's really valuable, to be honest. Like, Same I to you. I mean, I've learned so much. Like that when we first got invited, I was like, I'm so thankful for your sharing because I don't know what long COVID is. And you, and it seems like a lot of doctors don't even still oh, know yeah, no one what knows. it is. So it's like I, it's, I've really enjoyed, like, learning because it's, you know, we don't know how many people are affected yet. Yeah. It's like, you know... I, what you said, one fifth or twenty percent. Yeah, there, yeah, it's like all over the place of so, what that looks like. It's but, so important that you're. But doing I think that. in general, with everything that everybody's dealing with, they act like they know, and really, yeah, they don't really know anything about yeah. all of them. But mental health, this, that, mm -hmm. they're all sorting out as it goes. And like, the more I, you know, speaking generally from different generations, my mom's like, "Oh, I don't know anybody with fibro fibromyalgia." I'm like, "You don't. You guys don't talk about this." Everybody in my age range, we're like, "We got this, 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 this." You know, like. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure you do, actually. Like, you literally, you guys don't talk about it. And that's mm -hmm. how, that's the change with the, you know, all the, the youngins, you know, is, and is actually speaking more and having the online space and utilizing that in ways that can connect people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, with that, you know, I just want to thank you all for coming. Thank and you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Yeah. Perfect timing. Yeah.